So I'll turn now to our second reading from Mark chapter one. After John, we're talking about John the Baptist there, so we understand. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. As Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come follow me, Jesus said. I will send you out to fish for people. Once they left their net, at once they left their nets and followed him. When he had gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. Without delay, he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. Friends, here ends the reading this morning of God's holy word. May God bless both the reading and the hearing. Will you pray with me? Almighty God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable unto you, our rock and our redeemer. Excuse me. So yesterday I spent the day on my computer, like I am with you, with a bunch of preachers. I'm on a committee called the District Committee on Ordained Ministry. Um, local pastors who aren't fully ordained or new pastors that are just getting started and need to be certified um, all have to meet with us from this district. We had um, 12 interviews, I think it was yesterday. And having uh, been preparing um, this sermon and having these uh, scriptures on my mind, I realized that I was sitting with people who have um, already decided to follow Jesus. I was sitting with people who had heard Jesus say, follow me and I will send you out to fish for people. And they had dropped their nets and followed Jesus. It's a story that is fascinating in that we don't get a lot of detail. It appears in both of these scriptures that Jesus said, follow me, and they dropped everything and followed. What was it about Jesus? A man they barely knew that caused them to to drop their nets, to walk away from family, a home, and job. We don't get a lot of explanation. Um, we know that a couple of these men had apparently been disciples of John the Baptist. So they had heard John proclaim who this Jesus was. And maybe a couple of them had heard Jesus preach or teach. But it's still not a much to go on. To leave home and job and family. To follow this rabbi who says, follow me. We know that, that Peter at least had a family. At least he had a mother-in-law. So that means he had a wife somewhere. And he left. Who paid the bills? Who tended to things? Because we know from other places in scripture that there were women who traveled with this group of Jesus and his disciples. And it was these women of means, uh, for whatever reason, they had wealth. And they were the ones supporting, buying the food, taking care of Jesus and the disciples. So Peter wasn't sending money home. To help his family pay the bills. We just don't know what happened here. What it was that made them so ready to drop everything and follow Jesus. And it would be nice to pinpoint exactly what it was. If we knew, if we knew what they had seen, what they had heard that caused them to do that, then 
we would know what our own level of commitment and participation needed to be. I mean, surely they saw and heard more than we have. We've not been face to face with Jesus. So maybe we're not really obligated to follow Jesus, to come and see this business of ministry means. We don't mind following Jesus. We love that unconditional love. But dropping our nets, leaving everything familiar behind, surely that doesn't apply to us. These, after all, were the disciples, the apostles, that after the Holy Spirit filled them, built the church. They had to drop everything and follow Jesus, or we wouldn't be here today. We're not those first apostles. Surely it doesn't apply to us to walk away from everything. There's a story about a young woman. She had many friends who were faithful Christians. um, And they tried to invite her to be a part of their Christian fellowship. And she just staunchly refused. And finally, they said, what what is it? You know, what what is it that you don't want to be a part of? It seems like you're intentionally trying to run away. And she says, well, I don't want to live in China. And I'm afraid if I become a follower of Jesus, he's going to tell me to go to China to be a missionary. And I don't want to live in China. And her friend sort of laughed at her and said, Honey, you don't have to go to China if you don't want to. God may ask you, but but you can say no. Her friends assured her that she could become part of their fellowship of believers without risk of having to move to China. Imagine how surprised they all were a few years later. When that same young woman got on a plane, left her home and her family to start a new life in China as a missionary. She was right to be afraid, but she discovered that when you discover what Jesus has for you, you will willingly and joyfully. Fulfill what he calls you to do. She wanted to go to that place to invite people to come and see the Savior named Jesus. We don't have to do likewise. God has many roles that folks can play in the body of Christ. I guarantee you, we're probably not all going to be called to go to China. To be a missionary. But it still would be nice to know exactly what it was that Simon, Peter, Andrew, James, and John had seen and understood that they were so willing to drop everything to follow Jesus. What great miracle had they seen? What was that lure? Oh, we're glad they went. They hadn't have started the church if they hadn't gathered the first community of believers of faith. We wouldn't be here. We're just not sure we want to drop everything. I'll be honest. I don't want to move to China or Honduras. Or Timbuktu. Or Alaska. But how do we avoid that? How do we follow Jesus? But avoid. 
that call. I may not be the best one to ask. I have to tell you what I did about 35 years ago. My student loan information had not come through. So my father and I went to the bank, signed a 90 day loan and moved me to Texas to start seminary. Having no idea if in 90 days, I was gonna to have to drop out and get a job to pay that bill if my financial aid hadn't come through. I may not be the one to ask, how do you avoid dropping everything to follow Jesus? Because God does call us to move outside of our comfort zone. Oh, he won't do so without your cooperation. But he just might pester you continually until you do what he wants. And God wants us to move out of our comfort zone so that we can reach those who do not yet know they are loved by God. When I started my senior year at Illinois State, I had no idea that a year later that I would be in Dallas and seminary on that 90 day loan. My campus minister, Tom Newfer Emsweiler, had asked me if I'd ever considered ministry and I laughed and said no. And he said, well, just promise me you won't put it out of your mind until you've given it some consideration. And I promised him that, and Tom promptly put me on the mailing list of every seminary in the United States. Okay, that's probably not true. It just seemed that way. Um, he put me on the mailing list for the United Methodist seminaries. There were only eight, but it seemed like 80. It went like this. I'd pray, God, I have no idea where I'm headed. Would you please give me some wisdom and understanding and I'd go to my mailbox and I'd open the mailbox and I'd get a flyer or a postcard or a letter from some seminary and I'd find the nearest wastebasket and throw it away and say God I really don't know what I'm supposed to be doing could you give me some wisdom here it's not just that I'm a slow learner When God calls us outside of our comfort zones, we don't follow easily. We don't surrender our own hopes and dreams and plans easily. We don't surrender home and family and job and security on a whim. To simply follow without a job description without knowing what the time commitment is, without knowing exactly what it means to go out and fish for people. You know, I'd like to read the small print that terms of service, you know, if, you, if you're online at all, every once in a while you come across something and they want you to mark that you've read their terms of service. And most of us just say yes without reading the terms of service. But in this business of dropping everything, I want to read the terms of service and know exactly what I'm getting into. To follow without knowledge, to simply trust that Jesus has invited us to follow. That's a hard thing but it's important. It makes a world of difference, if not for us, certainly for those we encounter on the journey. The nation of Liberia is a hot and humid place. And I'll be honest with you, it smells like diesel fuel from the generators that are run. It smells like garbage because the infrastructure infrastructure, the basic um, things they had had for so many years 
had disappeared. They turn in, in Monrovia, the place where we spent most of our two weeks, they turn the water off at eight o'clock every night. We were fortunate. The compound we stayed in ran their generator a full 12 hours every day. But in that hot, humid, smelly climate, everywhere we went, we were greeted with cheers and songs and dances. They put palm leaves around the doors, and we found out that was a, a symbol that you were hosting a, an important dignitary. It was sort of uh, reminded me of Palm Sunday and laying the palms down for Jesus. They just pulled out all the stops for us everywhere we went. The woman who was leading her group had been to Liberia many times and she knew the answer. So she coaxed us to ask them why every place we went, there was such a celebration. And they said to us, we have a proverb here in Africa. If white man leaves his comforts to come to my village, I know that God has not forgotten me. If white man leaves his comforts to come to my village, I know that God has not forgotten me. I'm not sure I'd want to live in Liberia more than that two weeks that we were there. That was already outside of some of my comfort zone. But they helped me realize that even those two weeks made a difference in Christ's name. We need to remember friends that as humble servants of God, we are called, and God is prepared to use us if we make ourselves available. I don't know and probably never will fully understand what Simon, Peter, Andrew, and James, and John had seen that made them so ready to drop everything. Maybe it was simply a matter that um, the Spirit of God was already guiding them because God knew how he wanted to use that bunch of disciples. I don't know what it was that made them step out in faith and do something they'd never done. Jesus said they would fish for people, but I'm sure there was no casting of nets involved as they were used to doing. But God called them to something new. And God calls us to something new, to be his servants and share his love. I love the excitement that Peter had when he goes to get Nathaniel. Come and see. Come and see such excitement. And friends, that, that really ought to kind of be our mantra. Because God has done so much for us. We ought to want others to come and see. We ought to want to share God's love, not just in our actions, but in telling people how beloved they are. We ought to want to let others know they are forgiven, that they are beloved beyond anything they could understand. We've been given a savior named Jesus. We've been given forgiveness, salvation, eternity. Why wouldn't we share this good news? Unconditional love is so contrary to what we see in the world around us. At every turn, we're getting messages about what we need to do, what we need to prove, what we need to purchase, what we need to possess in order to be top tier. We don't need that. Because we've been given unconditional love, salvation, and eternity. 
We ought to want to share that. And we don't have to go to China or Liberia to share that good news. There are those around us closer than we might believe who need to know that they are loved unconditionally by the creator of the universe. Right now in the midst of COVID, there's probably a lot of folks who need that. We've been isolated and separated. And it's easy for us to think we have been forgotten. There are probably friends very nearby that need to be reminded of that good news of Jesus. We have a great gift of salvation. But sometimes even those who have turned to Jesus need to be reminded what they have. So it's not enough that we live a good life. We need to live a transformed life. And in living that transformed life, love others unconditionally. We have been called to share what we have been given. It's been a continuing theme for the last several several weeks. God has um, brought up to me so many times in so many ways. That this business of sharing God's love isn't just necessary for those who have never known Christ. Those of us who know Christ, many of us are struggling in this time of COVID. I want to encourage you to listen to how God speaks to your heart. To let him put someone on your heart who needs to be reminded they are loved. Even if the name that comes to you is someone that makes you think, well, she already knows Jesus. Well, he's already accepted Jesus. But discouragement and depression is everywhere. And so we need to be reminded. Even if we've accepted Christ, we need to be reminded. This is such a hard time we live in. We've been forced in many ways to drop everything and to live a different way. but we have the good news of a story to to tell, of a cross and an empty tomb and forgiveness, salvation and eternity. I don't know who it is, maybe on my screen today or in your life and in your heart, but there are those even those who already know and love you. That in this difficult time. Need to be reminded. They are beloved. By the creator of the universe. They are saved. By Christ Jesus. And they are held tight in the arms of the Holy Spirit to bring comfort in. Listen to your heart this week, friends. Let God tell you who it is in your life that's feeling unloved. I'm not asking you to drop everything. Leave your boats, your job, your net, your family. But I encourage you to reach out, to say to someone, come and see how much Jesus loves you.
reach out. Oh, we are so close to being vaccinated and being able to go back to something that might resemble normal. But I think that makes these days even harder because we get so antsy. Remind one another of God's unconditional love. Remember you are beloved and tell someone else. We need that precious reminder. Let God lead you to the one that needs that message. Will you pray with me? Lord, we read about the the apostles dropping everything. And we forget that there are people right here around us. We don't have to go to China. We don't have to go to Liberia. We simply need to follow your nudges. That we would be your hands and feet, your voice of love. Oh, what a hard time we're in. Lead us to the ones that need to be reminded. Those living in discouragement and depression who need to be held in your love. Lord, show us, show us who needs to hear, to be reminded, they are beloved. Lord, we ask this in the amazing name of our Savior, Jesus, one who taught us to pray together, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us of our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. The glory of God.